Hello, my name is Kate McKinnon, and I'm here to introduce my project, Contemporary Geometric Beadwork. We're doing structural modeling and wearable art, which is to say we're making fine craft jewelry that we use to model the structures of creation and interact with a variety of fields. Have a look. What follows is a lecture given at the MIT Status Center this October 2015 after a delightful week spent studying where we've been, what we're doing now, and what's on deck for the future for our project. So, why sewn beadwork? Well, it engaged me from the very beginning. Even as a child, I had the human tendencies towards the things that humans always seem to do. Two things seem to be wired into our DNA. We find things with holes, and we put them on strings, and we ornament our bodies. Animals do a lot of things, and I've been very engaged watching the bower bird build its fabulous curated exhibits in order to attract a mate. But humans are the only creatures that I've seen ornamenting our very bodies. We do body modifications. We wear jewelry. And so I chose to go into one of the most ancient fields because it needed not only innovation, but it was rife with potential and inefficiency. And I find that combination so alluring I can't look away. And it also allowed me to do my counting in the type of units that spin themselves into gold. When I'm creating fine craft, fine jewelry, the units that I'm connecting into this beautiful wearable art fund the work itself. Everybody wants jewelry. These pieces are very unusual. They're very engaging. And so we're actually able to, through the production of a line of fine craft work, and the five textbooks that have followed the production of this work, nerdly volumes written to explain not only the method of production, but the thinking and the questing that went into the work. And we've paid attention not only to the quality of ornament, but the quality of the questions that we asked before we even picked up needle and thread. We have noticed that we have been able to model the most shockingly beautiful things. And I have a list on the boards of some of the things we love to model. It goes without saying that arrays and ratios and pixels lend themselves beautifully to being modeled by tiny individual units. There really isn't a lot of difference between one of our beautiful glass beads and a pixel or a data point. And no matter what we're modeling, there's always a way to express ourselves. When we model language, we may be writing poetry in Braille, in beadwork, or we may be actually mimicking the pattern or quality of an actual language or an actual statement in a language. And we model color theory with everything we do because the beads not only are colored glass, but they will hold light. And so we can explore flat color. We can explore the color of light. Through our photography, our film work, and our exhibits, we can explore the different qualities of the work in different lighting, in different settings, with different people looking at it. A mathematician may look at our work and see the structures of creation. A fashion model may walk the runway with these pieces atop her body. We model fashion in a way by deliberately making our counting and our questing into objects of beauty that are designed to appeal to that oh-so-human urge that we all have, biology. What could be simpler than modeling biology? Everywhere in nature we see the same forms repeating, and they're all the basic shapes and forms and structures of life that not only do we know, we love. So biology, you saw the pictures. Coding and codes. Two different things. Coding that we model might be genetic coding. When we redid our thread paths, and this was some of the new work that we did in this ancient field, 
we actually modeled the thread paths that we replaced the existing runs with with structures that mimic DNA and our cloning mechanism mimics RNA. It was a natural, and, and it was really a natural in that we arrived at it naturally. I prefer modeling and solving naturally, not perhaps to write a code that will advise me of improbable or undoable shapes, but I model specifically to learn what is possible. And following mistakes, following unlikely shapes has been the path for many of the innovations, including these fantastic thread paths. Now, when I say thread path, I'm speaking like a craftsperson. The thread path is the actual path our needle and thread takes through these glass units to connect the beads together to make work. People have had a variety of strategies for getting the thread through the beads and making the connected shapes. Until we had these truly integrated thread paths, there really wasn't an efficient way to soar into the air, to take flight from the initial contact of bead on bead. But we discovered that when we had engineered our thread paths to more accurately mirror the natural structures of life, these, these forms leaped into being on their own. Not only that, they were willing to accept basically genetic coding in the first round of work. Now, this was thrilling, it was surprising, and it was a bit shocking, and, and I'll go into that. So coding might be genetic, computer, AI. It might actually be code. That's fun, too. Codes are something that we very much love to explore, and we'll get more into that soon. We can certainly model mathematics. It's the simplest thing in the world. In fact, secretly, all along, I've been modeling people's favorite ratios, favorite equations, and I can point to some of my pieces and say, oh, look, that's based on the Fibonacci spiral, or oh, that's based on my husband's favorite geophysics calculation. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the information is. The question is, how does it apply to everything else that we've done? How does it apply to what we might do next? So all of these things that we're modeling, each exploration is equally interesting to me. Number theory came up because I have a friend who's a physicist who, when I explained to him a few weeks ago that I had suddenly had this blinding realization that there wasn't any difference between three and five and one and 243, because I suddenly realized that the way that I was interacting with these objects was based on the outside edge or some single number that expressed the entire shape. And it, it suddenly struck me when I was looking at a rectangle and thinking about how it was inherently different than a triangle, I suddenly realized that it, it really wasn't. Each of those three shapes, well, presuming I've actually connected my circle, each of these three shapes is in the way that I am measuring them essentially the same. The only question I have about these shapes is how long is this line, this line, and this line? These corners, uh, they're just ornamental. We don't need there to be any difference between one side, four sides, and three sides when we're contemplating, for example, cloning an edge. If I just want to go ahead and take a cast or a clone off of that rectangle, there's really no difference whether I take it off with four corners, with three corners, or as a long straight line, which if connected could represent the circle. It's exactly the same number of beads. And I suddenly realized that the corners were ornamental or directional insertions, and that the only reason that I might want to have these shapes be different is that if I were, say, storing grain or trying to fit 
into an interesting pattern or trying to evenly divide things in a gridded city. It might be very convenient if I needed to perform some practical calculus that only using a triangle would get me, whereas using a circle wouldn't work. And there are times that I might need one, three, four, 200 to be different. But generally for our purposes, particularly for our cloning purposes, they aren't different. And this was a shocking realization. And when I told this to my physicist friend, he said, ah, you're a numbers theorist now, are you? I said, no, but thanks for letting me know where to look. And so we have a great project, a cloning project, that demonstrates number theory. It demonstrates exactly that there isn't any difference in the way that we're counting between the circle, the triangle, the square, the rectangle. So that was fun. We also model structure, which is obvious. And shape, which is a little bit different than structure. But one of the things that we've only recently started modeling are deconstructed shapes. I began to be fascinated by the concept of taking a triangular puff, a three-dimensional beaded triangle that could be squished flat or puffed up like it was holding volume. And I was looking at this triangular puff, and what I really wanted to do was open it up so that it would basically be a strip of beads. Take one corner and open it from one of those corners. And we would be looking into the two open horns, looking into the hearts of these mountains, these conical inroads into the piece. And it was a very different experience than turning that strip over and looking at them from the outside and seeing that they were mountains or horns or folding it back into the triangle and seeing that they were corners. And it helped me understand that there wasn't really any difference between a corner and a horn. There wasn't really any difference between the increases and the decreases that we were making to create the zigzag or rickrack fabric. It's just that we thought they were different. And so we devised different tactics to deal with each. Seeing after five years of work on this project, which is how much I've put in, you know, I was so engaged by these, act, by these ideas that I felt that they deserved a comprehensive study. And so I gave them the full measure. I gave them an entire academic study of five years. And it feels so strange to, at the point of the end of that study, in which the shapes have become very complex and the things that we've been modeling have become basically beyond my comprehension. To then come back to the very beginning of the project and where most people start and to realize that in that first peyote triangle that only started with three beads sewn into a circle, in that information was basically not only all of the information I'd accumulated since then, including all of the extremely nerdly information on physics and science and structure and form, but it also contained the basic math, structure, and form of creation. And when I realized that the thread paths that we had engineered mirrored, not mimicked, but in a way mirrored DNA, and that our cloning mechanism, our elegant guide round or exploding round, mirrored RNA, and that we were using it in the same way, I could see how efficient it was to separate the RNA from the DNA. That's a very efficient way to copy. But to actually bring things together that are far apart in order to connect them was inefficient. And so we made another wonderful breakthrough in the mechanism that our field had been using to make the up and down peaks in that we were able to show how instead of building one bam, bam, bam on a spine or a ladder build the way a crane builds itself and the structure follows, the decreases to make the other set of peaks were actually being hunted and gathered from material that had been previously built out, almost as if we were on one side had an ice cream vendor that had all of their scoops of ice cream ready to go so that when somebody ordered a Neapolitan, they could just bam, 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 make it and 
make the next one. And then there we were over at our ice cream stand where half of the cones that we could make, we could go bam, bam, here you go. And then the other half, we had to go just a moment and we'd run over to where we kept the chocolate, be right back and we'd run over to where we kept the strawberry and then boom, we had to like be the manella to connect them together. And I thought, why are we doing this? Why have we been doing this? Why didn't it ever occur to us that we could build the down peak the same way that we built the up peak? Well, I have a lot of theories about that, but we'll get to that in a minute. At any rate, it was working with deconstructed shapes that helped me understand that a corner was not different from a mountain unless I needed it to be, and sometimes I do. Architecture. Very easy, very satisfying to model. Science. I don't necessarily want to do science. I want to model science. And we model the process with our discovery. We model the shapes. We model the human beings. Oh, we're not done yet. Other fields, items, ideas we like to model. Topography, our ups and downs, our peaks and valleys, our mountains and hills. We like to model potential. The elegant guide round that I mentioned that looks like RNA that we use for cloning is all about potential. And every time I include that round in my piece, that's exactly what I'm modeling, the potential that that round carries. And it may be that I fold that round up flat and it just looks like an ordinary round because it will mimic or mirror in the way that a good cloning device will, anything it's next to. But I know, and that round knows, it's got something special. So potential, you bet I'm modeling it. Textiles, one of the first things that struck me about sewn beadwork was that it was a fabric. It was a fabric of sewn glass. And I immediately, I wanted to understand how the thread structure, if there was one, was different than the glass structure that we were making with the thread. And I did an interesting experiment because I was sure that it mattered and yet nobody seemed to think so. So I worked for a while and I made two strips of flat sewn beadwork using a stitch called square stitch, which is basically just a very sturdy series of connected loops. I made a flat strip one inch wide and six inches long in thin walled glass beads. And with the first strip that I made, I did it mindlessly. I was not thinking about the thread. If anything, I was thinking in an annoyed way, as we sometimes do as beaters, about how the thread was the weak point in the work. Stupid thread. And so I made the first strip. And then the second strip, instead I decided to consider the thread as an ally. Having examined the clothing I was wearing, I realized that perhaps the problem with the thread wasn't that it was the weak point. Perhaps I, in fact, had been the weak point. And so what I did was I made what looked to be an identical strip, but in every stitch I made, I deliberately interacted with the thread. It didn't take any more time. Because I use a fiber-based thread, I can understand when my needle approaches it. I have the option to pass through it, in which case the fibers of the thread sort of felt themselves together. I have the option to pass under or over it. And as you become handy with your needle and thread, you'll be able to make these decisions on the fly. And so it took me no more time to make the strip that I made mindfully than the strip that I made both mindlessly and somewhat resentfully. I took them outside onto the concrete and I smashed them both with a hammer. After the dust cleared, the glass dust, don't worry, I wore a mask, I picked up what was left. And the thread from the, ba the bracelet that I had made mindlessly was just a sort of um, somewhat connected pile of loops. It looked like pig pen's dust cloud. It looked like a chaos field. Whereas the other one that I had mindfully made looked like a loose weave linen shirt. And I thought, fabric, textiles. I could have a secondary structure inside the glass. And it's real. And it matters. And it can mirror the structure on the outside, or it can change it. 
It can distort it, deform it, make it, make it tight, make it flow like water, make it feel like a fabric, or, or make it hold water. And I began attempting to spread the word, good news. I went out with my rice bowl, basically, with the good news that this work had a secondary structure. And, well, I didn't get a lot of interest. Undaunted, I marched on. And we began looking at things like the Kalibi Yao manifolds that model space time and sewing our little bangles to see what we could come up with. I began interacting with my friends who were scientists, physicists, doctors, and we began modeling heartbeats, spectra, graphs of all sorts in the up and down patterns, the rickracks. I began modeling data sets and distributions, and I began really engaged with the project I saw here at MIT called the Robotic Garden, in which they've crafted uh, a bunch of possibly origami, perhaps just folded paper flowers, and the flowers are on little robotic sticks. And not only do they have movement, but the flowers are meant to be a computational array. And this is the sort of thing that we can do with our beads. And in fact, skipping ahead only slightly to our projects on deck, one of the things we've got on deck to do here at MIT is to craft a new sort of robotic garden that would be built with our glass forms, possibly very large. We do have public art funding. We're thinking about that. But our work will also be a computational array. And there are many nuances that we can build in because we're working with glass. And one of the materials that I'm extremely interested in is conductive thread. Because if the thread itself can not only carry a charge, but an image, uh, I'm very engaged in this. The, the Blue Man Group, for instance, right now is fascinating me because the costumes that they're wearing are actually sewn of this conductive thread so that the dancers' bodies uh, not only can change color but can be, in essence, video screens and projection from within the materials that the materials could actually computationally change to demonstrate our data sets or our artistic ideas uh, is extremely engaging. So we have some sophisticated and some simple projects underway. Uh, other things that we're modeling, and I'm really engaged about working with the people here, are all of the different codes. Codes we dig could fill up another set of boards. But over here, moving to fields we peer into. Now, these are not fields we aspire to join. These are fields we are plundering for people who are interested in the ideas that we're having about the small shape modeling that we're doing. Geometry is obvious. Uh, topology, topography, anthropology, this is one of humanity's most ancient fields. Very interesting. Number theory, as I said, string theory. They're the people who have the beautiful manifolds ideas about the models of the universe. Genetics, not only to study the basic forms, but also having the idea that it's possible that just as we replaced inefficient pathways to structure with these much simpler, more elegant, pathways that modeled our own genetic structure and the structure of the world around us, it's possible that there are other calculations or other processes of solving that might benefit from reformatting their calculations, their queries, or their structure of their inquiry also into these basic forms. One of the theories I have about why it may have taken so long to make progress in this field is that we hadn't actually moved to elemental forms. And as soon as we did, as soon as we made these thread paths, the discoveries just began to roll. That was tremendously interesting to me. Robotics. Think of the things we can do. If this work starts to walk around the room, don't even get us started. We're already started. Don't even try to stop us. Mythology, oh, this became very, very interesting when I began to explore these concepts about how everything seemed to be the same as one and how one 
basically seemed to be a whole unit with zero, and that there didn't seem to be, A, a whole lot of difference between the two, or B, anything I couldn't count just using a one and a zero, as anybody who works with binary knows. Uh, this, this struck me as very elegant, and I began looking into mythology because I began wondering about how this RNA tends to express as a stick with crosses or receptors, and these sticks are used for counting and cloning and state changes and direction changes, and when I suddenly realized that I could make absolutely any form in the project by just using one small or infinite, it didn't matter, stick. One of these sticks with teeth, these basic receptors. It didn't even really matter how long my wizard stick was. If it was only an inch long, I could create new structure off of the end of it. It suddenly became clear that maybe I didn't need anything at all except just a way to anchor my first stitches. And that's when we realized we could have tear out pieces of paper in the book where people could simply start these forms almost from nothing, from a piece of paper, from dissolving thread that is used in the garment industry for basting. You can sew a little bit in place, put the piece in water, and the start can either float away if you're doing magic tricks with dissolving thread, uh, explode away in dramatic fashions if you're using one of my RNA concepts as an exploding round where certain pieces are removed and the whole thing goes into pieces. It, it's just also loaded with potential. And when I realized that I could make almost anything from one little stick, and if that stick was infinite, that I could probably build a universe, I began thinking of them as wizard sticks and I began wondering how many sticks did wizards have? It seemed to me that I probably only needed one, but I imagined for reasons of showmanship, wizards have had a variety of sticks. And so as an experiment, I began wandering the streets of Cambridge asking everybody I ran into, how many sticks does a wizard have? And the gamers answered me from their games. People who were mythological answered me from their own mythology, or for example, some people in culture had the concept of, say, a wizard who lived in the forest with a stick, and if you got lost in the forest, the wizard would paralyze you with a stick and eat you. And I said, was that good or bad, punishment? He said, oh no, everybody knows that. If you're lost in the forest, a wizard with a stick will eat you. I said, I'm not surprised. I looked into the Christian mythology, and I noticed that the uh, in the 23rd Psalm, the, the Lord is referred to as having a rod and a staff. And I looked into that, and I found that the rod uh, was probably a shepherd's rod used to count sheep. Uh, all of these things became more than interesting. They became fascinating. And so this is a study that is ongoing. Uh, the fiber and textile fields we're both interacting with and attempting to innovate in. Sculpture we're doing. We have public art money, as I said, and we're going big. But I consider all of the small pieces we make to be basically maquettes, tiny models of things that could be any size. And we're working with architects. We're fascinated by architects. Some of the structure that we have built is incredibly architectural and has potential to hold weight far beyond what we're using it for. Fashion, absolutely, because we have chosen to count units that spin themselves into gold, as I said. Fashion is one of the places that we can look to, not only for revenue, but for presentation. And let me tell you, when you put some of these structures of the universe on, say, Iman and walk her down a runway, people are gonna take notice. So we are absolutely working in the world of fashion. And chaos remains one of the most interesting studies to me. I infiltrate this field whenever possible. And in fact, my own work has been strongly influenced by reading in this field. It's a longer story. 
teams that we have going. And this is important because this is where we are welcoming involvement. And as this is an open source project, you'll see that is the number one team on my list. We are actually working with a stunning number of people. Currently, the active participating force in the project is somewhere about 30,000 people. We're all connected through social media or our internet presence. Occasionally, small subsets of us meet in person. I have gone all over the world and met the people that are participating in this project. They're engaged, they're intelligent. It's fantastic. We just had a meeting here at MIT in which we were 12 people together from all over the globe, and we were working together to solve some of the basic problems we were having. For example, developing a consistent notation, something that could be read in our beadwork by a space alien, anyone who had the capacity to intuit or understand base 10. We made sure that on however many sides of our piece we had, we had complementary calculations or pieces of information so that if you could intuit or infer that the three numbers were the same, you could easily crack our code. We did it, and we did it here on the hallowed nerd boards, and that was so much fun. And it was also empowering for the people working in the project, which leads me to a concept that I share with some of my fellow wizards, which is the value of the curious amateur. I personally have never had time to specialize. Had I devoted myself, for example, to becoming a chaos theorist, uh, well, I'd still be working. And instead, my job in this project is to run all of these teams. So open source needed to come first. And I actually had a little theory that one of the things holding us back from advancement in our field could possibly be that We've been trained to have a certain set of values about sharing information. And traditionally in this field, the field of sewn beadwork, there's a lot of kit learning and work that's done by designers and then lovingly replicated by beaders. And there hasn't been a strong incentive or encouragement to innovate with the idea being that the goal of doing that was to become one of those designers who would then make the projects that everyone else would replicate. I can't even keep my mind on that. Instead, I would like to encourage people to innovate on their own. And going open source turned out to be the way to do that because we were able to release all of our technical information on how to create the work for free. Actually it didn't harm the book sales. We sold more books. The more information we gave away, the more books we sold. And it became clear that that sort of karmic principle of balance of giving and getting was working demonstrably well in the project. The more we gave, the more we had to work with. And I find this to be true in absolutely everything we do. Uh, so open source has been very important to me and I've actually had to work for it. It was unusual in our field and it was not warmly welcomed when we first began doing it. However, five years down the road, I think we'd have trouble finding anyone who could say it was a problem. The internet is how we communicate. Taxonomy is so important because we are inventing new language and we need to be on the ball with it. We need to make sure that our technical terms are well thought out, that they relate to one another, and that we're presenting them in an organized fashion and in an engaging enough fashion so that people will use our language, use our words. And it, I think it's really correlated to an idea that I have that if you're asking people to accept a new concept, you often need to invent a new word or phrase or technical term to describe what you're doing. If you're trying to use old words to describe new work, it's not as effective. So that taxonomy team has been hugely important. Education, we are 100% behind the idea of not only educating, but mentoring. And there's a whole suite of people working in our field that would appreciate and benefit from active mentoring. This would be bead store owners who are teaching basic techniques why not give them our entire library of basic techniques and let them teach beginners 
from the beginning to do the things that we have learned after all of this advanced work. Reading groups that spring up independently or as a function of bead stores or bead societies or art groups, we are attentive as we can be to these reading groups and provide them with free teaching guides, projects, information, and updates. Public art, we're starting to do it all over, and this is a team that'll be a lot of fun to be involved in. And then the most important one to me, and why I'm here, nerd outreach. I wouldn't be peering into every one of these fields if there wasn't somebody or some suite of people in these fields that was open to what I was trying to do, to bring classical structure, attention to detail, and an understanding of the potential of not only the materials we're using, but the techniques we're using to take this work into a realm that can not only model, but in some cases help explain, illustrate, or provide a different way of looking at what the people in these and other fields are doing. And so I have made it my life's goal to never let the brilliant people get away. I have been curating this, this cherished swarm of geniuses for my entire life. And I have used every single one of them in this work. And it's been the best thing I've ever done. So this is really, really important, this nerd outreach. And then just to close, to tell you some of the really fun things we've got going on. This is gonna be great work. Uh, the museum and gallery is just one line on the board, but it is a massive swell of institutions, small and magnificent, that are becoming aware of what we're doing, and they're extremely receptive. Because, again, we've chosen to do something that spins itself into income, we are able to fund our own project. We don't have to write grants. If we want to make a piece of public art, we can make a piece of public art. If we want to travel to an institution and give a seminar, we don't have to only go to places that can pay our travel expenses. We are self-funded. And I think anyone in any field who's writing grants to try to do the work that they want to do will resonate with this idea. Open source led us to full funding. And it may have seemed counterintuitive at first, but it's because we made those choices that we now have these choices. And there isn't a museum or a gallery in the world that we could not make a captivating presentation to with the work that we've put in. And that is a fantastic feeling. Point being, though, there's room for you in any of this, including the museum and the gallery exhibits, the fine craft. One of the exhibits we're working on right now, I alluded to earlier when I was speaking of code, Braille, fascinating. We're making a series of pieces that are wearable art that have poems, poems for the blind written in Braille. And uh, we're doing another set with coded messages. And as I mentioned, we're working on an updated robotic garden I was captivated by Salvador Dali's uh, beating heart that he created. His was done, I suppose, of rubies and gold. We're working in our tiny units of glass, but imagine what we can do if we're working with robot overlords. We could animate that beating heart so that it, well, it could do anything. It could mirror your computations for you, or in Japan now, the kids are wearing animatronic tails and the tails are hooked into their biorhythm so that, for example, if you walk up to me on the street and you make me feel things, my tail will begin to move and reveal my feelings, whether I'm frightened, annoyed, intrigued, in love, my tail will tell you. What if my beating heart did the same, responded in real time to you while I was wearing it? Sounds fun, doesn't it? Get involved. Conductive thread, like the Blue Man Group. Just think of what we can do, and just think of what we could do if it was big. We could put a, an orrery, the model of the solar system, on the side of the MIT Planetary Building. Oh, we'll be here 
at the MIT IAP sessions this coming January, teaching open sessions, seminars, and hands-on classes. We will be attempting to work with all of the robot overlords that are interested in us and engaging all of the curious amateurs that would like to participate. And even people from these fields are curious amateurs when they're working with us. So there's room for you. There's room for your ideas. We're engaged in working with you. And we look forward to what comes next.